welcome back. Second half, change in moderators. I hope I can keep up with how Martin did it because Martin was awesome. Um, please clap in the chat if you feel like it. And uh, let's go to the next talk. So let's go way back to 2008. In April, GitHub was published. And Martin was one of the lucky persons on earth who joined the beta program so he could pick up one of those two letter usernames. That's awesome. And uh, we can welcome him back because two years ago he was already here and talked us uh, through his journey from um, Elm to Clojure. And today he's going to be talking about Clojure Notebooks, um, kind of continuing one of the earlier talks. And please welcome the man who aliases LS to LS-G to suppress printing of groups, Martin Kavala. Hi, I'm Martin. Let's talk about notebooks. For those of you who aren't familiar, a notebook typically mixes prose, live code and visualizations. You might have heard of Mathematica and MATLAB, both of which have been around since the late 80s. In 2001, the open source IPython notebook was first released. It later became the foundation for the Jupyter Notebook and has seen tremendous growth since then. By the way, the name Jupyter comes from its three main languages at the time, Julia, Python, and R. Jupyter was first released in 2014. Around that time, I dove into this article by Brad Victor. In it, Brad laid, uh, lays out a future in which scientists have the much needed better tools to tackle the world's most pressing problems, like climate change. Now Brad's work is so tangible that it seemed possible or even easy to turn it into something usable. I, like so many, fell for Brad's magic trick. Today, we're a good five years into building a notebook platform around our interpretation of his ideas. And I have to admit, it's not quite as easy as I once thought. So do consider this context. I'm a builder of a notebook platform and I do consider notebooks a step in the right direction. But as a closure team working on notebooks, we've struggled to make them a significant part of our workflow. And as a believer in bootstrapping, it's not for a lack of trying. Let's look at the problems we faced and go over them one by one. The first problem is that I love my Emacs. And my colleague uses Cursive, another one uses Wim. You might love TextMate, or maybe not anymore. Maybe you like Sublime Text. Um, it's a really fast editor. You can open big files in it, which seems like a pretty nice feature for an editor. Or you're using VS Code. So it comes down to everybody loves their editors. And it's no wonder. Folks spend years or even decades tweaking them to make them look and feel better. So it's quite a ask to let folks leave that editing environment behind and write code in notebooks instead. But the main promise of notebooks is really interactive computing. For Jupyter, this means controlling evaluation at the level of cells. But in Clojure, we do have great support for live programming with our editor connected REPLs. And we get evaluation at the expression level, Clojure's superpower. So it's hard to win over a Clojurian to notebooks for the interactivity. There's also a ton of innovation happening in the Clojure ecosystem around going beyond text for visualization. It started with Rebel, now there's also Reveal, Portal, and Shadow Inspect. The second problem is hidden state. Now, Clojure being a functional language with a strong focus on immutability makes hidden state a bit less of a problem than, say, Python. And we have techniques like functional core imperative shell, as well as Stuart Sierra's reloaded workflow to somewhat contain the negative effects. Still, hidden state remains the root cause of a lot of problems in notebooks. 
but I think it's unfair to attribute that to notebooks. It's a general problem in computing more broadly. If you don't believe me, try to think of the last time you fixed a problem with a restart. Third, notebooks are hard to reuse. I think this is undeniably true today. Jupyter uses a JSON format for its notebook. At NextJournal, we're using a markdown flavor. But regardless of the specifics of the format, the existence of a custom format means running and reusing it will be more complex than having just normal namespaces that I can require. To address these issues, we've built a small library, Clerk, and I'd like to show it to you today. Our goal is to make it easier for our team to communicate through notebooks. So in Clerk, we drop the editing within the notebook from the solution in favor of a notebook format built on top of regular closure namespaces. The pros part being markdown comments, the same format that Maria Cloud uses. This is what it looks like. Now this simple change is really killing two birds with one stone. Now folks can keep using whichever, whichever editor they prefer and reuse becomes trivial. These are normal closure namespaces that you can put into Git and treat like all your other closure code. And in order to let folks really use whichever editor they want without requiring an extra plugin or config, the interface to Clerk is also really simple. Just save the file and changes are reflected immediately. Let's take a look. You can see I'm making edits in Emacs and the changes do show up right away. Now making this work also ties into the hidden state problem and is a bit more involved. You can see this notebook has a, a cell that's got a thread sleep two seconds in it, but we're having a much fa faster feedback loop. So obviously, run, doing the naive thing and running a notebook from top to bottom on each change would result in a pretty dismal feedback loop. So we're going to look at how exactly Clerk evaluates. And this starts from the file watching. Then we'll look at the parsing. Then there's a static analysis step, a hashing step, and finally, evaluation. Let's look at file watching first. Unfortunately, the built-in file watcher in the JDK is that slow on macOS. This is where David Nolan stepped in and has solved this in Krell. Thanks for, to him for letting us extract this into a tiny library, Beholder. Once we've gotten a, an event that a file has changed, we parse it. We're using rewrite CLJ which also gives us access to the line comments, which make up the notebook's pros. This is a notebook um, where we're doing the parsing, and you can see the results of the notebook parsing itself. So you can see we get a vector back and um, a vector of maps that are either of type markdown or code. And the markdown parts we obviously use to render the, the prose document, and then we want to evaluate the code. Next, we read each form and do static analysis on it using Tools Analyzer. In this step, symbols are fully qualified, and we record three pieces of information for each form. The form itself as closure data. This means it's identical regardless of white space changes or comments. For var definitions, we also drop the var name from the form, again, keeping it constant while refactoring top level names. Then, second, we record the symbols it depends on. And lastly and third, the origi originating location. Let's look at that in more detail. So a symbol can either point to a closure var or to a Java class. For a closure var, the originating location can be a file on the class path, or it can come from a jar. For Java classes, we also consider two cases, things from jars 
or JDK built-ins like Java Util UUID. We don't look at those further. We perform this analysis recursively for all closure bars from class path directories. We can ask the resulting dependency graph questions like, give me all the transitive dependencies of a given bar. Here we're using James Reeves' fork of Stuart Sierra's dependency graph library for this. We can then sort this graph topologically and compute a hash for each symbol. For closure bars from class path directories, we're using the form and the dependency symbols as the inputs for the hash. So remember this hash will stay constant regardless of white space changes or changes to the var definitions. For things from jars, which will change much less frequently, we currently compute a hash by hashing the jar itself. This means, for example, when you upgrade closure, most hashes will change. Something we might revisit in the future if we want more granularity. Now that we have this map of hashes, we can finally proceed to eval. So the first time clerk evaluates a notebook, it's writing the results of each top level form to a cache directory. The file names being the hash. It's currently a simple Eden cache written using print string and read using read string. So this next time clerk evaluates a notebook, only the things that have changed will be re-evaluated. Other things will be just read from cache. Now because Clojure and Java are impure, we cannot identify side effects reliably. So clerk allows you to opt out of caching by tagging a form or var with this no cache metadata. For side effectful things that you do want to cache, like a slow database query, we, we recommend that you add something like this instant to your form to get caching while retaining control over eval. Update the inst and clerk will reevaluate it. I hope this gave you a basic idea of how clerk achieves its fast feedback loops. Let's look at the view side next. So clerk comes with a number of useful built-in viewers. One interesting thing to mention is that we don't prepackage any libraries like Plotly or Vega as part of clerk, but load them dynamically using D3 require. This means that you don't need to load a big bundle up front. We can just load what, we, what you need. We also designed the viewer API to be open and extensible. Let's look at how that works. Like I said, there's a number of built-ins and viewer selection works based on the number of tiny functions that add metadata. For values that can't carry metadata in Clojure, we wrap it in a map. So you can register viewers using keywords, and the viewer is just a function that can be built on top of other viewers. Here, we're defining viewers, three viewers based on the hiccup viewer. You can also override existing viewers based on types represented again as closure keywords. Now this is where it gets interesting. Rule 30 is a cellular automata. The rule is just the eight element map you see here. It's known for generating surprisingly complex behavior from these simple rules. Here you see them represented using our default data viewer and it's pretty hard to see what's going on. Let's fix that. First, I'm telling Clerk to use the cell viewer to draw numbers. That's better. Now, let's bring in our custom viewer for vectors. Nice. And finally, for the whole board. So that's all about Clerk. I'm really excited about this possibility of molding views to fit the problem at hand. Now Clerk is built on top of this amazing ecosystem and community that we have in Clojure. I'm grateful for being a part of it and love how we're able to explore things independently but inspire each other and remix each other's ideas. Building Clerk would have also been a lot, lot harder if it wasn't for the small libraries I've used throughout. 
You'll find explicit mentions for them at this link. Clerk will be open sourced later this year. If you found what you've seen intriguing and would like early access, please do reach out. Thank you. So, thank you, Martin, for this talk. Uh, and thanks for pre preparing it, uh, recording it earlier in a very unusual, quite new format for the conference. Um, and uh, let's go into a little Q&A session. How do you feel after the talk? Pretty good, thank you. How was it listening to yourself? <laughs> well, I didn't listen to, uh, <laughs> that much, <laughs> I must say. That's always a bit painful, yeah. Cool. Um, I think we're all used to that. Um, yeah, uh, I have to admit that a lot of people are using, using this notebook concept and it seems to be very popular, in particular around data scientists. And somehow it just doesn't ring with me. Is that a kind of a developer personality thing or am I just not spending enough time to try it out? What do you think? Well, I mean, that's, that's I guess, sort of the, the conflict that we we had in our team as well. Um, I think there's, yeah, there's something really interesting in notebooks, kind of the, the promise of going, yeah, like taking computation beyond text and like being able to really add interactivity to output. But yeah, as developers kind of coming from our IDEs, yeah, it's, it's often a hard sell. And so I think it's often kind of, yeah, new folks entering the field that, yeah, that are most attracted um, to notebooks. And yeah, but I hope, like, I think it's kind of natural that, yeah, that will be quite a journey to um, to make this happen. But yeah, in the end, I still believe that there's, there's a lot there. Um, yeah, and, but yeah, it's like only natural, like, I don't know, what do we have like 50 something years with mainly text as the editing interface. Um, right. It it will take some uh, yeah some time. Well, it takes a generation to sink in. <laughs> yeah, and I mean yeah, the small talk folks yeah they have quite this legacy of um, yeah of going beyond that and yeah, but uh, yeah, who knows if and when it? I guess not. Like Jupyter Notebooks is probably the closest uh, to make this part of the mainstream that we have right now. Yeah, they're quite quite widespread, right? We have a few questions over in, uh, in the Slack channel. So as usual, everybody, please post your questions to either the ClojureD Slack channel in the Clojurians Slack or uh, put it in the uh, chat in Gather Town. Um, Martin is asking, would it be possible to integrate Clerk into a Clojure script app, thinking of rendering components and playing with them in a storybook style environment? Yeah, so that's definitely something that's that's possible in theory. Um, I've now chosen to use Sci kind of as the evaluation environment um, because it's just a lot less complex to to set up. Um, like you don't need a REPL connection to be able to evaluate code, and so this will always work. And yeah, I think it's quite a like yeah the closure script REPL. It's generally something yeah that's that can be brittle at times. Yeah, so. Um, avoided the complexity there, but yeah, nothing is preventing this in, in theory. And Shadow, for example, has this nice API to evaluate closure script via just a promise, a function that returns a promise. And so, yeah, um, something that's definitely planned for the future, I think, to make this work within your app, um, also in closure script. Yes. Cool. So, did you, did you take the chance to uh, bump into Michiel uh, already in the in the conference here to have a chat about Sci. Well, uh, yeah, I'm I'm talking to him quite a bit about Sci stuff all the time. Yeah, um, and also so I'm around today. Yeah. So when no, you... I mean his 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 awesome work is really yeah it's one of the big pieces of this um, enabling this. I mean it's it's it, it also must be kind of worrying. I mean in particular with your uh, with the non clerk like the non local notebooks to evaluate code that somebody's typing in, right? Um, some kind of sandboxing in place or something like that, or am I just not getting the concept? Yeah, so when you when you evaluate this stuff, yeah, on the on our platform, yeah, there's definitely like 
yeah, sandboxes. Like you, you basically on on our platform, you get your own machine that's executing the code remotely, and yeah, and kind of the client side stuff, um, closure script we evaluate in the sandbox iframe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, another question is, uh, what about error handling, syntax error exceptions and the like? So how do you propagate those back to the to the developers? Is what I think behind this. Um, yeah, so when, when there is an error, you would like, yeah, see kind of a, um, uh, like the even output of the error message currently. Um, but yeah, that's one of the things that I still want to polish a bit, uh, yeah, before it's ready to release. Like this was one of the things that didn't quite make it in for the talk um, to have this really well polished. I think, yeah, another thing kind of I want to have kind of execution feedback like for like a status bar, seeing when each cell executes, how long it takes, um, stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So still a little bit to add. Yeah. When you say release, what can we expect? Would it be a product? Um, Source component for everybody to use. What is the idea? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it will be released as a library that yeah you can you can use inside your project. So yeah, Clerk is definitely like meant to be used kind of in process as a library that's got access to all your code. And yeah, we'll see how it goes. Maybe I can send out a preview to folks that are interested next week or yeah, sometime soon. I hope. Cool, and you will have to do some marketing, right? Clerk is not so easy to find if you go to, to the internet and search for it. It's like a very- Yeah, so, so yeah, so far, yeah, there's, there's nothing there yet. Um, was hoping to get it out in time, but it didn't, didn't quite work. <laughs> Next time, let us know. Maybe we could push out the whole conference for a week. No, I, I guess- Yeah, I'm, I'm glad I got the talk in, in time, so. <laughs> yeah, once again, thank you for that. Um, there is another question from Miro in the chat, uh, thankfully copied over to Slack. Thank you, CMP. Um, can you run this with Spark as you would Jupyter Clojupta? Clojupta, is that how you pronounce it? I hope. Um, with Spark, so then it wouldn't, um, so then it wouldn't be in process anymore or? Um... I cannot tell you. So yeah, I guess I mean Spark as I know it is kind of, yeah. Um, um, I think uh, executing the code kind of on a, on a remote cluster. Um, I, yeah, I'm not completely sure. Like to the extent that this returns something like, like a normal closure function, I think it should be possible, but yeah, we'd have to try. I hope that answers the question. Um, <laughs> it's also very simple thumbs up, which is kind of a voting system here, I guess. Um, yeah, anything else you would like to share from your from your journey with with Clerk? Or if you like, um, what else? Um, now that it's yeah, um, I think it's been a pretty like I must say surprisingly pleasant experience. Kind of yeah, um, like. When I got into Clojure, um, yeah, we started kind of what you shouldn't do in Clojure, kind of as a more kind of monolithic app. And now we're thinking about like how to how to take things apart and yeah, make them usable as smaller libraries. And um, yeah, I'm definitely liking that side of of Clojure. Yeah, cool. It sounds like a wonderful wonderful tour that you're taking there. Um, that's it. We're out of questions here. Um, Let's have a look at the at the chat in Gather if there's anything else. Um, no, can't find anything. Then I would say maybe everybody in Gather um, as a kind of virtual way of applauding things. Maybe you can wiggle your avatar in the in the big hallway or in the in the uh, virtual auditorium that we have. Um, just want to see that happening would be fun, I guess. Martin, thank you for being with us. Thanks for your Thanks a lot. the time to prepare the talk. Um, you're part of the conference. It's awesome. Right. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye.